I didn't get with John and Jonathan and ask him to sing that song, but I'm glad he did. Because it's a good song and also because of the lesson I hope to bring this morning. And I'm simply asking the question of who is this Jesus that we hear about from the scriptures, the Bible? I think that if we try to answer that question as if we never heard of him, all of a sudden he's before us it would be a very difficult thing for us to do because even with all those who reject him down through the years and have fought against Christianity and the New Testament and the Bible in general, he is still so much before everybody. But it would do us good to try to answer that question, who is this Jesus? You'll remember in Matthew 16, did Jesus himself ask the disciples, who do men say that I am? And as I've often said, when you go to ask people their views of something, then you get different answers. In verse 14 of Matthew 16, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he asked, but whom say ye that I am? And it was Simon Peter who confessed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Try to imagine back in that time period when the Lord is just beginning his earthly ministry. They're in a little place that's not much bigger than the state of New Jersey. They're among a people with customs, background, and history of prophets. They have a deep abiding concern for a Messiah to come and a kingdom he would establish, though they have false concepts, many of them do, if not most of them, of the nature of that Messiah, the anointed one, and the kingdom he would establish. And they begin to hear about Jesus, but it doesn't begin with Jesus. It begins with one called John the Baptizer, who has gone before Christ begins his work on earth, announcing Christ, announcing the kingdom. And from those who followed him, having believed him and were baptized under baptism, repentance for the remission of sins, Mark 1, verse 4, that many of the disciples of Jesus came, and his apostles too, some of them. So they're alive down there with, what is this? Because there had been no prophet in Israel for over 400 years. No prophet. And they were a people of prophets. And they studied the law and the prophets. And as I said, they knew of a Messiah to come. And then here comes John saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We can't have a kingdom without a king. So that meant the king was at hand. And as his fame, and that's the only way to describe it, spreads as a teacher... And, of course, the miracles that he worked, beginning with the miracle of turning the water to wine in Cana marriage feast in Galilee, and on he goes from there to where John would say at the end of his gospel, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And that all took place in a little over three-year period in that little place of small geographic boundaries. And by the time that the church was established, that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, 
Jerusalem was all abuzz because the chief priests and others thought they had ridden themselves of this problem with the killing of Jesus, but they hadn't. In fact, they recognized rather quickly that those who were the leaders in this had been with Jesus by the very boldness by which they declared the truth. And more than that, they were so bold and frank in their proclamation of the gospel that they accused them of being the murderers of Jesus Christ. They did not back up. So a number of people must have been asking, who is this Jesus? He has stirred up what some might call a wildfire. But then as the church grew and Jesus is preached and more converts are added to the Lord, Great persecution comes. One of the leaders was Saul of Tarsus. The church is scattered everywhere because the persecution is so terrible. Only the apostles were left in Jerusalem. And it's after that that we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus because he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Things are being set in order because the gospel is about to go beyond the Jews and the Samaritans. And then you have the conversion in Acts 10 and 11, accounts are found of it there, of the first uncircumcised Gentile convert, Cornelius, and his household. Then the next thing we know is after the gospel is preached in Samaria by Philip, it's preached up in Antioch of Syria, and we learn there's a church established there, and that's a Gentile church. And don't you know that all of this buzz that was going on, and this is brand new in the world, people are saying, who is this Jesus? Well, it's the gospel that will tell us who he is. It's the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular because it's the New Testament of Jesus Christ that reveals Christ to us. But back then, while Jesus was on the earth in that little place of Israel, people must have really wondered from what the New Testament says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the things that he did and stood amazed. And yet for all of that, many wouldn't believe. Then as the church grows, can't you imagine among those who didn't really know the Jews or know the God of the Old Testament or the Old Testament. And yet here comes people preaching Jesus Christ. Now what did they preach? Well, if you'll look at Paul's message, if you'll look at how he approached people, you'll see that it wasn't many times a long, detailed message. Notice how he says it to the Corinthians, reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians, what he had preached to them. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Then watch him pinpoint it. For I delivered unto you first of all how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Now, do you think that's the only time he ever wrote those words or every time he ever spoke, only time he ever spoke those words? I think not. Because he's telling us exactly what he preached. 
And anything else he would preach besides those explicit words would back those words up, would be tied to those words. And when you look at the other sermons that he preached in the book of Acts, you see just exactly how he approached those things to answer the question of just who is this Jesus. This is a question that is a profound one for our day and time. How many people, if you walk up to them and say, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth? What do you think they're going to say? This is the man on the street. Well, I dare say, we probably can't know. Not so sure that would be a good project. <laughs> but I want you to notice Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9 on this matter. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Does that sound like what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? It certainly does. But that's also tell you how plain and to the point they were. There is no salvation from sin except by belief and obedience to Jesus Christ. Now, if you look out among those who claim to be preaching Christ today, they do everything they can to make a person not feel lost in sin. We have let it come down to us to where I just want that person, I, I, I just don't want that person to feel bad. I, I just can't afford to say that to my good friend, to my family member. I can't do it. Brethren, that just shows we don't have biblical love for those people. That's all there is to it. We don't love them. You can say what you want to about an emotional attachment about sentimental feelings. But when we know the world's in sin, they need to know Jesus Christ as He's presented in the Bible. They need to know they must have such a belief in Him that they must obey Him from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. We're taught in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, if you have a Buddhist friend or a Hindu friend or a Muslim friend or whatever friend you may have that's not a Christian, just quote that verse too. Man has a choice. Believing in Jesus Christ, learning His will and obeying it to be saved and remain faithful in the church or nothing. That's a choice. But well, for some reason or the other, many people in the church think they can go out and convert the world and beat Satan like he ought to be beat and get people saved without them knowing they're lost. The Bible presents Jesus that you may have faith. I already mentioned John 20, 30, 31. That's why John said, I wrote John. I want people to have faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Son of God. When they say Jesus Christ, Paul sometimes, a lot of times, will put Christ before Jesus. There's a reason for that. Jesus means Savior. Christ means anointed, which means approved. So when you say Christ Jesus, as Paul does many times, he's saying approved, anointed, Savior. Nobody else like that. Never has been. Never will be. And Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I want us to study two great truths concerning who is this Jesus. First of all, men need to know that He is Jesus through whom God speaks, and He speaks through no other. Next of all, it is through this Jesus that God saves men from sin, and He saves through no other. Does that remind you of John 14, 6, where John records Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
The way people present Jesus and Christianity many times a day, claiming they're friends of God and friends of Christ, wouldn't convict anybody of anything. People have to know there is no other way but Jesus Christ of Nazareth as he's presented in the Bible. People must know there is no other Savior. There is no other way back to God except through Jesus Christ and His gospel, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1.16. Look in Hebrews chapter 1 and see how the inspired writer approached them. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath made or appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What are his credentials? Why, he's deity. He's the son of God, and he produces those things that only deity can produce. You see that in these words, that he is the brightness, express image of his person. And what did John say again as to why he wrote his book, John 30, 20 and 21, or 30 and 31, John 20, 30 and 31? Well, it was to prove Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He's appointed heir of all things, verse 2. And as heir of all things, he is the Lord of all, Galatians 4 and verse 1. He was made, according to Acts 2.36, in the first recorded gospel sermon that Peter preached on that day of Pentecost, the day the church started, he's made both Lord and Christ. Paul writes in Colossians 1.16, and it is also said, as we've studied in John 1.3, that Jesus is the creator of all things, whether material or spiritual. In verse 3, which we read here in Hebrews, we learn that he is the image of God's very substance. Human language does not give complete expression, and I don't think can, to his divine qualities. Jesus expresses to us his heavenly father and our heavenly father he said when you've seen me you have seen the father he opposed all things by his powerful word and he and he alone could and did make purification for the sins of mankind verse 3 of hebrews 1 and we know that we have the word of god that reveals to us this Christ as the way, the truth, and the life and the only one through whom we can go to get to the Father. His word is authoritative. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And his greatest work, for lack of a better way to put it, is that of redemption. Buying us back by shedding his blood for the remission of our sins, Luke 19.10. And Paul reminded the Roman Christians of that, Romans 6, 2 through 5. Verse 4 of Hebrews 1 says he inherited a name more excellent than the angels. And no angel was ever called the Son of God. He's called God and Lord God, verses 8 and 10. 
Thus he's eternal, verses 11 and 12. Notice those words. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old, as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. They shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Now that's the Jesus that's presented in the scriptures. And it's through Jesus that God saves. And that's the point, the second point I wanted to make. So when you ask, who is Jesus? Then we point these things out and answer to your question. And notice they come from the Word of God. You can't go out here and know anything about Christ except that you know the Bible, not anything correctly. Looking in Hebrews 2, reading 5 through 18, For the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Should taste death for every man. He came into this world knowing that he came to die. To taste death for every man. As the incarnate son, having been tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, he could die on behalf of man. Verse 9. Jesus then by his action brings many sons unto glory, according to verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now you think about this for a moment and he just started talking about you if you're a Christian as the Bible defines and uses that term. Jesus added the saved to the church, Acts 2.47, and the saved were those who had been brought to belief in Christ, repented of their sins, and were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.27. Thus, they stand before God on the way to glory. Their sins are remitted. They're not a part of this world in the sense they live like it and they think like it. Their aspirations are of it. No, they're right the opposite. This world becomes more of an alien place to a person as he becomes more like Christ. Jesus brought to nothing the one who had the power of death, according to verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also took upon himself likewise the same, that through the death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Sin and sin only separates man from God. Man may have a lot of problems, but there's no greater than sin. That's your greatest problem. And until the world understands that, there's not going to be a lot of change in the way the world operates. And if the Bible is accurate, and it is, then many choose to go through the broad gate and the wide way and enter right on the easy-go-lucky road to destruction. Sin separated man from God and brought him under bondage of Satan that leads to death. Now, we hear a lot today about slavery, about being in bondage, about the evil of slavery. Think for a moment. The whole world is a slave 
to Satan. And he who offers them freedom and is the only one that can offer them freedom, who has overcome death, hell, and the grave, who offers liberty in Christ, they spurn it and remain a slave to Satan. Jesus delivered those who through fear of death were subject to bondage, verse 15. He removes this bondage through bringing life to light, according to Paul Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.10. The forgiveness of sins, as we have noticed in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus became then a merciful and faithful priest, verse 17, even our high priest. Thus we are assured of mercy, for he is touched by our infirmity. I want you to imagine, if you can for a moment, maybe you won't have to imagine that hard. Some of the most difficult times you have had. Maybe you're undergoing those right now. Problems that are peculiar to being a human in a sin-devastated, cursed world. Jesus, the great physician, has the way out of that. So whatever you're undergoing, and I would say this, the whole world will hear me now in its own language, whatever language people may speak. He can relieve you of all that because this world's passing away in the lust thereof. And no matter how sick you may be physically or how whatever it is that plagues you, even this shall pass away. His mercy is extended us through the gospel. Jesus is able to help those who are tempted, according to verse 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. When our faith is put to the test, that is, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, we're being tempted. Solicited by the devil through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, to violate the commandments of God, then your faith in Christ, which faith comes from the Word of God, Romans 10 17, will strengthen you. Because you'll put your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. We can know that He knows and that He understands. You can't get yourself, or other people can't put you into it in such a mess and in such agony, pain, and shame that Jesus does not know and he does not understand. Now there is a sweet peace, a peace that passes all understanding, that faithful members of Christ's church can have if they will but call to mind the truth of God's word about the brevity and uncertainty of life, and the eternal glories of a resurrected body in heaven forever and ever. We have no ultimate salvation on this earth. We have salvation of sins so that we can, if we remain faithful, have the eternal salvation with Christ. As long as we remain in the service of Satan, though, we are separated from God, according to Romans 6.23. We have the power to leave that bondage because we have the power of choice. We can choose Jesus and his gospel with the resolve that I'll never be moved away from him. I will keep his commandments no matter what. And heaven will be our home. And so we plead with everybody, those who are members of the church, to remain faithful, to know Jesus Christ, to show Jesus living in your life wherever you are by keeping his commandments putting into practice the enriching principles of the gospel of peace, understanding that Christ understands you. And whatever it is that you're undergoing, he's your best friend. There's no better. And though you have dear loved ones in the flesh, your own family and friends, they cannot be to you what Jesus Christ of Nazareth is, for he ever liveth to make intercession before the Father for you and for me if you're a child of the living God and faithful to his cause. We've studied this morning in this brief lesson about knowing Jesus, how to become a Christian. If you haven't done that, we urge you to do that now because without Christ, you have nothing. 
And if you die, you lose it all in that shape. Why put off what you know to do right now to become a Christian? As a child of God, if you're in sin, why put that off in the sense of repenting of whatever the sin or sins may be? Coming to confess them, having repented of them, and we'll pray with you and for you, and God will forgive. Christ stands ready to receive all who will receive him on his terms. So with humility of mind, we approach the truth that can set us free and whereby Jesus reaches down even to you and to me. If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you then to come while we stand and sing.